But thank you all for being here, and uh, it's a great day, and it's a great day to be in Traverse City. So we'll get started with the presentation. Um, my attorney said before I came I had to put this forward-looking statement up, all you financial people, that you like to take all this information and invest and do things with. So this just says you can listen to me or you can, but whatever you want, it's up to you to make your investment. So the airport authority, I'll start off um, uh, with a little, a little history and, um, and really tackle some of the interesting things about the airport. We were born in 1935. So before I go any further, where was the airport? And it was on the radio last week, so trivia answers out there. Where was the airport located prior to its current? And right in this area here. Uh, Ransom Field is what it was called here on Veterans Drive, and all of this, and Memorial Gardens is the main, main location, so yeah. So they moved from Ransom Field to over to Cherry Capital Airport in 1935 and constructed a 3,000-foot asphalt runway um, at the time, and the first air service was 1938 with Penn Central uh, Airlines. Penn Central later became Capital Airlines, which later became United Airlines. So um, <clears throat> the service was to Detroit and then also to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, but next up that came was World War II. So during World War II, the Navy came in and leased the airport from the city of Traverse City. And when they did that, their main focus was to create a top secret naval base for the creation of drones. When World War II was happening, the Japanese had the kamikaze, and we had no answer to it. So what our Navy was trying to do at two bases, Traverse City and Virginia Beach, is design a, a, a solution to that issue. And drone technology was born. And they were flying drones from the airport off to a carrier um, out in West Grand Traverse Bay. But they disguised that as pilot training. So they also were doing carrier training at the same time. Um, so a quick, unique story is they would crash drones throughout the area, but they put mannequins in the drones so they'd go out and rescue the mannequin to make sure people realized or kept that top secret uh, technology. So, so anyway, after the war was over, the Navy returned the airport to the city of Traverse City, and they continued to operate until about 1974. Uh, under the city control. And at that time in 1974, the city looked to get multiple partners to join in and form an airport commission. And at that time, Grand Traverse County and Leelanau counties joined in in the operation of the airport. And the ownership then was split between the two counties. That operated in that uh, airport commission format for many years to 1990. And then in 1990, the city left the airport commission and the two counties then jointly operated the airport um, until October of 2021. And so in 2021, and years, a few years prior, we went through a governance study of the airport, its business plan, strategic plan, and we tried to figure out what was the best methodology going forward. One of the biggest things we found was the regulatory guidance under the state of Michigan under the aeronautics code. Really, as an airport commission, we didn't fit anywhere. They really didn't have a true structure for us. But in 2015, there was the airport, Regional Airport Authority Act that was passed because of the governance transfer in Grand Rapids. And so at, when that was passed and we put our model into that, we fit that model, we fit that regulation. We finally found a home. At the same time, we were doing a lot of property work and going back through our historical airport property maps and layouts to track all the transfers of property and everything else. And the FAA said, you know, it would really be nice to have a new governance transfer so we have a point in time to start clean. Because what we found is there's, as you go through historical properties, you have a little bit over here and another source of information over there, but nothing's consistent. And so we're able to do that, bring that all under on run, run umbrella by doing it with one governance. It gave us a lot, though, of opportunity to going forward. 
We are at a time with the two counties where we are going to have to extend our operating agreement because we are getting to the point where if we are doing leases, we were within the time frame of go, ex, the, the leases had to go beyond the time frame of what the airport commission was operating. So we would have had to done a lot of additional work with both counties to get leases passes. So we decided that it's just best. We went through a study and we determined that this was uh, the best way forward. So with the help of Mr. Janik and Nate Elger and both counties, we went to work and we studied it and studied it and we came out with the best solution. And today we have nine members on the board, uh, six are appointed by Grand Traverse County and three are appointed by Leelanau County. So it's a great opportunity. One member that Grand, Grand Traverse County appoints comes from outside the area and the current, that current member comes from Otsego County, which is Paul Beach now. Um, the airport, the impact to the community is measured at over $1 billion. So when we look at the air impact in the state of Michigan of airports, Detroit Metro impacts Michigan at just over $8 billion. Grand Rapids impacts Michigan at just over $3 billion. And Traverse City is third in the impact in the state of Michigan at over $1 billion. So we're excited to be able to have that impact. The next closest airport that impacts the state is Flint at about $600 million. So by far, we will always be the third. Now, maybe passengers will go back and forth with Flint, but economic impact is the way I like to measure things, and that is, will always be Traverse City. So talking a little bit about the finances, um, our operating expenses are about $8.7 million. Um, there, we have no debt. We have no bonds. Uh, we have paid off all our debt. Our pension is funded at 100%, and we are 100% supported by the operators and users of the airport. We have no local millage, no local tax dollars to support the airport. Our primary cost areas, of course, most business personnel costs, occupancy costs, purchase services, and various others. When we look at our operating income, we have a balanced budget. That's thanks to our great finance team with Mark and Heather that do a great job. Um, 8.7 million. Uh, and when we look at that, our income is from rental income, rental car services, parking, landing fees, aviation fuel charges, etc. The business model of the airport is a very simple model. It's a landlord-tenant relationship. We have the facilities, we lease the facilities, airlines operate their product, uh, they're in charge of their product, they're in charge of selling their product. So it's a very simple relationship on, on how we operate. However, we have a capital budget that has to facilitate those operations. And the 2023 capital budget um, is really interesting because of all the federal money that has come uh, forward in the last few months. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill released a couple of different mechanisms for airports. One is a mechanism that's a $5 billion, five-year program that is focused on improving airport terminals. Um, we're receiving $5.5 million uh, for passenger boarding bridges. This will replace the boarding bridges at gates um, 1, 3, and 4. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill also did the Airport Improvement Grant Program, which is another $5.1 million for the terminal apron, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the airport, the traditional program of the Airport Improvement Program uh, we're doing an obstruction removal. That obstruction was the old terminal area. The blast wall, parts of the, uh, there's two blast walls areas that we're cleaning up, the old general aviation terminal. So all that's being cleaned up uh, for development by private sector, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then passenger facility charge. Uh, $4 million instrument landing system is uh, being worked on, and our hope is to have something in place with that. It's been a 16-year project that we've been working on, and we're hoping we're going to get it over the finish line either this year or early next year. 
that capital budget, where that comes from, is the users of the aviation system. So your ticket tax, when you have a $300 airfare, and then it's $350 or $360, all those taxes is what comes back to the airport. They come back measured in a formula of those that get on board at the airport, in planements. So if you fly out of Cherry Capital Airport, your tickets taxes through that formula come back to Cherry Capital Airport. So this is a current picture of the uh, ramp construction that's going on. And I have more later on that, but that's just, we're paving right now as we speak and uh, expanding our terminal ramp. With that, we have five great airlines at TVC. Allegiant, American, Delta, United, and starting June 16th, Sun Country Airlines. Sun Country Airlines is a low cost carrier they are service Minneapolis, St. Paul. They're using the 737-800 aircraft that's in the bottom right-hand corner that has 182 seats on board. We're really excited. On June 1st of this year will be the first time ever in Cherry Capital's history that all airlines will be operating mainline aircraft. On June 1st, American Airlines will be using uh, Airbus 320 aircraft on its Dallas-Fort Worth flight, and that'll be the first time all carriers will be using mainline aircraft. 17 nonstop flights. Um, so we pretty much reach every hub on the East Coast, um, and we're expanding west. So uh, we go as far west as Phoenix Mesa, um, and so we continue to grow. I went back and looked at my last time I pr uh, presented at the Economic Club, which was a few years ago, and that map only had five destinations on it. So, uh, almost eight, I think it was. So, in 2022, our freight, we had about 2.5 million pounds of freight go through the facility. Um, basically, UPS and FedEx, the UPS aircraft that's on the top, uh, that airplane flies in every day from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, their, uh, their worldwide hub uh, for UPS. FedEx comes in from Grand Rapids. We also have, um, uh, from Lansing, uh, additional UPS flights. The interesting part about this is we bring into the community four times the amount of freight than we ship out. And that really that was demonstrated through the pandemic with all the Amazon packages and everything else that came through. What comes into the community, so this is, this is really interesting, but the primary things that are coming through is, you know, we're starting to see a lot of medical, it's focused on the medical um, supply. Over 100 based aircraft are at TVC, um, and our major tenants include on the general aviation side, 45 North, that's their group of airplanes, charter aircraft, maintenance of aircraft. North Flight Aeromed, um, up in the left-hand corner. Av Flight, which is the major fixed base operator that provides fueling services um, to our airlines and our general aviation uh, care, our aircraft. Giving Wings is another flight um, instruction along with NMC and of course our US Coast Guard is, is at the facility. So now that's kind of an overview of what is the airport. And this is probably where really you're going to get in a lot of the meat and potatoes of what goes on and a lot of the airline side of the thing. So we do the airport side, but we also, as a small airport, have to impact the airline side. We are that arm of the airline marketing and, and impacting um, uh, their services. So I, I I thought I'd better grab a chart then to talk about the number of people getting on board, emplanements, et cetera, and what it really has me meant over the, the historical time. So if you look at this chart, the gray lines are the amount of people, the US industry, domestic traffic of people getting on board aircraft, and the blue below it is um, Traverse City. So on the far left axis is the multi-millions of passenger getting on. And then on the far right is the 100,000, uh, hundreds of thousands of people that get on at Traverse City. So when we look at some of the major events that have impacted um, the last 20 plus years, 
and how the cyclical nature of the industry is. It's very interesting to watch. When I got up here just after 9-11, um, we really watched the industry uh, rebound actually quite quickly. It was measured in weeks and months, um, and really it took a dip, but Traverse City did better than the industry itself. We started that climb back quicker because we're a destination, and we, we got back into that. Um, and that was, that, that's an interesting point for that type of activity because when the global financial crisis of 2008 started, that was a little different and impacted us differently. And it's mainly because of the discretionary spending that we all have. Really, the impact of the global financial crisis started for Traverse City in 2006. And we started to see that decline. And that lasted, really, until between 2013 and 2014, when a lot of others were really saying they came out of it in 2012 or a little bit earlier. So that crisis lasted longer. And then COVID on the end, which is really an interesting story, how the US is lagging behind, but Traverse City has really skyrocketed with its employments. So when we look at all of this, there's a couple of things that go on, especially with the philosophy of attracting air service. When we look at the global financial crisis, Wall Street really got involved in that time and said to the airlines, you must cut capacity, remove the supply of seats in the market. And what does that do? Simple economics, it raises prices, raises revenue, raises profits. That's how the airlines came out of that. However, they continued that practice for a long time in that 2010, 2016 timeframe. And what really, it was all, you know, supply side, supply cuts, aircraft cuts, and we heard really at that time the 50-seat regional jet was not very economical to have in markets. Fuel prices were going up. We took a different tact, and same kind of principle, but we called it capacity discipline. And that was a word or phrase that we developed and we went and met with the carriers. What capacity discipline means? Is there any other airports in the room? Because I'm not giving away my secrets. I'm not going to tell you. What capacity discipline is, is really focusing on the types of airplanes that are serving our markets and offsetting the risk by not asking for the moon when other communities are doing that. And it seems simple, but it's very difficult. Because prior to 2008, Airlines were courting communities. Airlines were calling up Traverse City or Kalamazoo and saying, come to headquarters. We want to talk to you about air service. After 2008, the airline said, we don't want to hear from you. Leave your mayor at home. The Chamber of Commerce is no good anymore. We don't want to hear anything about that. And there was a massive change in the philosophy. And the change was, your community has to earn the air service. They are a for-profit company, they are not a utility. And Wall Street put that pressure on the airlines to change their philosophies. And when they did that, we had to adjust. So many communities in that time went in and said, hey, the economic crisis is over, give us a bunch of new airplanes. And they did that, they don't have service today. What we asked for is, give us a 50-seat regional jet, Tomorrow, give us 66. Next week, give us 76. We did that philosophy all the way through uh, to 2019. And it's worked. And we've built that trust. We've offset that risk. And we continue to get the investment. And we're very proud of that. And so when the pandemic came and everybody wanted to get away from their big cities, we heard all kind of new terms. I think the latest one is escapage. Um, but all these new terms, whether it's business travel or the mix of business and leisure travel, come back to a point we also worked on since, the, since 2011. And that is, we are the destination. We want to be the destination, not only for leisure travel, but also for business travel. Because we want the people in our community spending the money 
not leaving our community and spending someone else, somewhere else. So we really focused on making us the destination. And when the pandemic hit, that's why we grew faster and continue to grow faster than everybody. Because Northern Michigan is a place where people want to be, to be able to spread out, enjoy the resources, and do all of that. So this is a lengthy explanation on a simple chart, but it's kind of our meat and special sauce that we do. This chart probably is very evident of everybody's revenue and their business. It's a calendar year of population of our Traverse City area. This is very, when you look at the blue, it's very consistent, our full-time population. Our part-time population with others coming out of the area to come in and work in the area, and then our overnight population. The airlines know this chart better than we do. The airlines know your spending habits, how you operate and, and come into and out of the area better than I think we know ourselves. By doing this, the question that's asked me all the time, why can't we have 17 destinations in January and as we do in July? And this is the reason, it's population. 17 destinations are great in July in the peak and we can get everywhere. But in January, we don't have the population to support that. We don't, that blue line needs to grow to that gray line to have 17 destinations year round. Is there a recent data that have you seen a change in recent? Uh, this is as recent as six months ago. Um, and has it changed? It's spreading out. The, the, the shoulder seasons, are now in the May. When we talked about this years ago, you were basically June, July, August. So September has grown more. It's it's spreading now. Kevin, okay, what, what is the Traverse City area? What defines that? Um, this defines for me from Wexford County all the way up to Mackinac Island. That's our Traverse City area. So talking a little bit more about the recovery of the pandemic. And this is a very scary chart for the Great Lakes region. So I'm going to handle everybody else first. The recovery that has started great is in the southeast, southwest, northwest, and west part of the country. That's recovering very well for air travel. The east, central, northeast, Alaska, and the Great Lakes have not recovered. They're still struggling to get back to the seat capacities that were of 2019. So the, uh, the recovery is very unbalanced across the country. It's returning to strong destinations. So pandemic, Florida, warm climates, all of that did very well. They started to recover. Great Lakes region, we saw an 11, we have 11% decrease in seats. It's, it's the most impacted. However, Traverse City is up 17%. We have two new carriers with Allegiant that started just before the pandemic and now Sun Country. And United has upped their capacity in the market over 44%. So we are bucking the trends. So with that said, in the country, 70, and this is as of Friday, 74 cities it was 67, I think, Norm, you came in the office the other day, it was 67. It's now 74 cities um, that have lost service since April 2020. They are not getting it back. This is loss of service, including Flint lost Delta, Kalamazoo lost United, Lansing lost United, and Muskegon lost United. These won't, this won't be coming back. And this is because of the economics of the 50-seat regional jet completely changed how they operate. It's too costly to operate. And so the industry, as I said, you have to earn it. We want to be on that plus side. We want to be saying we've got 17% more seats in the market. We want to be there. These communities are losing it, and it's just not coming back. So to tell a little more tale about the seats in the market that we have, when we look at this per capita and the amount of seats in the market, 
we have Detroit Metro, which is a major hub. So you have all kinds of flights, all kinds of capacity going through the hub. Naturally, they have the most seats per capita. However, Traverse City is next. Traverse City has the most seats per capita at 2.48 compared to everybody else within the state of Michigan. The average is about 1.1. The best part about this slide is with those seats, we have a load factor of almost 83%, 82.5. When we look at that, that tells me the majority of our peak time flights are 100% full. Our Tuesday evening flight, or maybe in the middle of winter time, a Saturday afternoon flight, those are the flight that you know might be operating at 60, 70%. So 82% or 80, almost 83%, when you compare that to 10 years ago in load factors, the load factor back then was around 72%. So very excited about that, that, that load factor. But this also tells a story of airfare. And so many times people will say to me, um, why don't we have the airfare that Grand Rapids does? Quick poll, how many people have flown out of Grand Rapids? We all have. But why do we do that? Because our seats sell out faster than anybody else in the state. So when they load all the flights in the beginning of the day, our flights are all within one or two dollars of each other. But they have more aircraft, more flights, more seats. And when you have that, our low care, our, if we're all going, let's say we're all going to Chicago, our, it's all loaded in, it's about the same. But we might only have 10 seats at that price. Grand Rapids might have 20. So when you're going to buy that, our low fare bucket sold out, you're already automatically looking at the next fare class. So you're now looking at Grand Rapids at being, oh, wow, that's cheaper. When it's, we, we had those fares in the market, we just sold those out. So what our job is, is to keep flying out of Traverse City so we keep getting the bigger airplanes to keep getting those low fare buckets. The more we can do that, if we're flying out of Grand Rapids, you're telling the airlines, I want to fly out of Grand Rapids. So hint, hint, I'm not saying anything. <clears throat> so this, this is a, um, a market share graph. And I put it in there because I'm going to have a test, OK? So over the years, um, you know, we had Northwest Airlines merged with Delta, uh, United Continental, American US Air. So we have the main legacy carriers here at the airport with American, United, Delta. Southwest actually makes up the other fourth carrier um, in that group of legacy, so to speak. And of those four carriers in the US industry, they make up over 83% of all domestic passengers. It's interesting when you go back to 1978 and you talk about deregulations, because it was four major carriers that the US said, we got to go deregulate the industry because we only have four carriers. Well, sure, we have a bunch of other carriers out there, but we have four major carriers still carrying the bulk of the domestic traffic. So the economics of deregulation has kind of re-regulated the industry itself in the, the way that the industry makes its money. But at Cherry Capital Airport, there has been a major trend. And Delta used to be the biggest carrier, Northwest prior to that, um, coming into the market. However, with the pandemic and the changes, Delta has drawn down some flight, but a United American has gone gangbusters in putting in more flights uh, into our airport. So United is now tied with Delta um, at 30%, both share 30% of the market, American at 26. G4 up there is Allegiant. So if you ever see G4 and it's referring to the two letter code, that's Allegiant. Sun Country will be SY, but this data is without them. So uh, United is, is, is really putting the pressure in the market. But there is a gray box up at the top right hand side that says other. So besides my staff, 
and the board members, who knows what the other airline could be that's generating business at the airport and who has seen it? Can anybody answer it? Nope. Nope. Good try, but nope. Nope, it's not with private se sector at all. It's not with the Coast Guard. And you're getting closer, but it's not spirit. <laughs> one day, yes, one day. All right, it's Alaska Airlines. Has anybody ever seen Alaska Airlines operate at Cherry Capital Airport? They haven't. So why are they, <laughs> so why are they recording? <laughs> it was a trick, it was a trick. So why are they recorded? Bingo. Code share. We have an awesome code share with Alaska Airlines and American Airlines that uses a code share that people book on Alaska, fly on American to Chicago, and transfer to Alaskan Airlines. It's booked so much that it actually is to a volume enough to be recorded by the DOT as air service out of Traverse City. Kind of fun. So industry trends impacting Traverse City, and really it's important to understand that air service development and what we do and how we gain that. We really are working to earn those air, the airline trust to come into our market because as the market shifts, the types of aircraft are shifting. And we've got to come up to the level of what that shift is. So we've got to be very cognizant of those processes. We've got a, we're seeing airlines continued pressure on the small markets, us. Smaller markets like Pelston, Sault Ste. Marie, Escanaba, all of that is getting major pressures and are losing service. So we got to be careful. I wouldn't, couldn't do a presentation without mentioning the pilot shortage. Pilot shortage is real. It depends on your perspective, whether you're on the pilot side and the pilots are saying there's plenty of pilots, we're just not paid enough. But on the other side, there's so much more demand for flights that there's not enough pilots to even meet that. And of course, fuel prices are impacting, uh, that is out there is impacting as well, and it's driving up airfare. So when we look at this issue alone and this line alone, it's impacting the, the, the customer the most in a way because your pilot pay an entrance for a regional airline pilot captain was about 65,000 prior to the pandemic. That is now 110,000. A regional pilot moving up to a first officer on a major airline is getting paid around 180,000. A captain then in the, in the main line is getting 220. And we always heard about the I'll call it the sexiness of the airline industry, of the captain flying overseas. You see it in all the movies and everything else. They're going to be making, after these contracts are all resolved, and we're hearing about all the strikes and everything else, but once these contracts are resolved, they'll be making upward of $600,000 a year. So that will translate back to ticket prices. It just, it, it can't go anywhere else. So. We expect this to continue. Yeah, who wants to change a career right now? That's me. So of course you're changing inflation and the economy is impacting, so that is, that is what's hitting our impacts. However, we continue to keep our airport costs low. We don't want to see our airport's costs translate into the airfare costs that are out there. That is why we do things like Costco on the airport. It's a non-aeronautical revenue source that diversifies our revenue portfolio so that airlines don't have that additional expense here at Traverse City. So talking a little bit more about the regionalization of air service, no longer can communities rest on the 50 seat to 76 seat regional jet. They're better use as pop cans um, than they are of making money for airlines. So they're no longer being manufactured and they're, they're really just they're a dinosaur. Communities have to be able to fill that 130 seat aircraft and they have to do it three times a day in order to maintain their air service. The Boeing 737, the 737 MAX, 
the Airbus A220 and the 319 are the aircraft that we're really focused on. Those aircraft, especially the 220, is a brand new aircraft that is going to have engine performance that outpaces the predecessors between 25 and 35 percent. The economics of that airplane is going to return service for us uh, to a higher level, but it's not going to go into places like Pelston or Sault Ste. Marie. So, which we fought so hard to get off of that floor years ago, and we're up. All those airports below us are going to go away, and we're going to be back at the floor again. Our job's going to start over, and we're going to have to keep climbing. Airlines are adjusting their schedules daily, and you heard me say this already. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. They're adjusting it so much daily that it, the airplane truly is a factory that comes into town and leaves the town, and it's our job to get them back the next day. Delta Airlines, and this hush, it's going to be released on Monday, but just gave us brand new schedules for release for this June. We're two weeks away. They saw their bookings and said, hey, you need more flights on, guess what, the interlock and changeover weekends. So guess what? They put in a whole bunch of more flights on Saturdays and Sundays for those interlock and changeover weekends. And because Sun Country is competing, we've got more Minneapolis flights into September. So airline schedules are adjusted daily in what we're seeing. And it, it gets back to if we want it, we have to use it. We have to use it here. So hitting back on some of that development, because we've got the growth, um, we're doing an air terminal ramp expansion. Uh, 130 feet on each side of the air carrier ramp to handle our overnight flights. Sometime we have up to 14 airliners parked at the airport. We're looking to expand the terminal. This is a master plan view. Uh, we want to add five gates here, hopefully maybe breaking ground in 25, 26 to add five gates with eventually in 2035 adding five more. Private investment, air, air flight, has built a brand new hangar. They've also are building a brand new fixed base pilot lounge main headquarter area. So they're investing in that. Um, that was another great piece of going to the authority because then we can now lease for over 50 years and, and get that done. So that gave us a great opportunity to bring private investment. We have three new uh, private hangars on the north side also being uh, proposed and constructed. Thank you.